Hi, I'm Dr. Cindy Dupuy. I have a PhD in learning disabilities. I do evaluations, um, a little bit of advocacy, and a little bit of intervention. And I'm also an adult with both dyslexia and dysgraphia. Hi, my name is Kim Sharman. I've worked with kids age kindergarten through college and I have training in dyslexia and dysgraphia uh, remediation. Okay, so uh, you and I, actually I came to you and said, let's talk about one of the most commonly used IQ tests. And part of the reason I said that, do you know why I said that? Because it is very important for parents to know what their child is being tested on in school and where some of the confusions and conundrums can be and knowledge is power so you as parents need to understand this topic yes that is in part it but you and i were looking at a case file together mm -hmm. on a student and i was talking about the whisk and i realized you didn't know some of the stuff about it mm -mm. and so i thought if you have been doing this for 15 plus years and you don't understand what's involved in a WISC, and you've read lots of diagnostic reports, and we've talked through a lot of kids together, how would parents know what a WISC is and what's being asked of them, right? So before we go anywhere with that, we want to say up front, we cannot show actual items from the diagnostic test because, do you remember why? Because Cindy would never be allowed to test again. <laughs> because it also, it, yes, it, it also it invalidates it, right? right. So if you actually know items on the test, and there are actually ways that I'm not going to tell you what those are, but a lot of people are resourceful. And so there's been some material created, and there are ways to circumvent the test, which is not in any child's best interest. I mean, the whole purpose of standardized testing is to better understand what's affecting a student's ability to function in the general education classroom. And we'll do a whole other video on just what IQ tests are, the philosophy behind them and all that. But let's today, we're gonna talk about the whisk. Now this is not the kitchen whisk hmm. that everybody thinks it is, but Kim, do you know what the acronym WISC stands for? No. Awesome. It's called the Weschler Intelligent Scale for Children. Weschler, I is the intelligence, S is scale, and C is for children. And it is one of the first IQ tests created. And it is one of the most used IQ tests by most clinicians out there. Now, when we started talking about this and I said, let's talk about the whisk. And you said, but Cindy, I think you hate the whisk. Well, I just know that the whisk is often used by school districts because it's the fastest IQ test you can give. Right. And then I said, I don't like it for a lot of kids because. Because it hammers on the disabilities that um, kids with dyslexia and dysgraphia often have, and it makes your IQ appear lower than it really is. Yeah. So knowing that this is a highly used test and knowing that a lot of school psychs out there are administering it, often school psychs don't always understand what the subtest is measuring as well, which I think is really interesting for most parents to hear. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to walk you through the various subtests. We've gone in and we've mocked up or we found things that are similar so we can actually show you things that are on this test, but we're not going to give any items that are directly from the test and we're not going to give you kind of the nuts and the bolts deeply of how the test is administered because then it's not, again, a useful tool for the clinicians then, right? Okay, yep. now, the first thing that we want to talk about, and we actually have some good graphics today, is the nature of the test, right? And so I actually, and I pulled up the wrong one, that was not very good of me, uh, first error for the day, 
<laughs> for the recording. I pulled up the cover sheet of the whisk. And Kim, when I pulled this up, what was your, when you looked at this, what was surprising for you? Um, there were quite a few sub tests. Mm -hmm. and, and I was a little confused because there were more categories. <coughs> Initially, the with the little parentheses around them. Okay. Um, all right. And so you were also surprised when I said you get a full scale IQ off of seven sub tests. Right. Right. Okay. So um, what happens is when you come in to use this test to get a full scale IQ, there is a battery that you're required to use to get the full scaled IQ and or full scale IQ, you shouldn't say full scaled. Anyway, you have to give these initial seven tests. And then I pointed out to you that there were commas or parentheses here. Do you remember what I discussed with those parentheses? Right. Those are not required. Right. Full scale IQ. Now, the other thing that I didn't tell you is that let's say um, somebody is administering the test and in the middle of the coding subtest, so a student has done the training up in it, they've had all the instructions, they're starting to do it. It's a fairly short test, but the school pulls a fire alarm or a fire alarm goes off. That subtest is now invalid because there was a significant distraction in the process of administering the test. And so if you don't have the coding subtest, then you can't get a full scale IQ. So the thing that they do is they provide mm -hmm. um, alternate tests, mm. okay? And so both simple search and cancellation are considered alternate tests. Now, the other really interesting thing is that I find a lot of school districts, especially in the Seattle area, are actually giving the 10 subtests that we used to have to give to get mm. a full scale IQ. Mm. And so even though visual puzzles, picture span and simple search are no longer needed, most school districts continue to administer all 10 subtests. Mm. And I personally don't know why they're doing that, but it is of note. Now, the other thing that is really important about this is when you look down this first column, it comes out with something down here. Do you remember what these are called, Kim? Uh, verbal comprehension. Right. Uh, visual, spatial, uh, fluid reasoning, working memory, processing speed, and then the full scale IQ. Okay. And so the technical name for these is index scores. So what you as a clinician will do is let's say the student scores a 34 on similarities. And after I've calculated their age, I would come in and say, oh, they have a scaled score of 12. And I've got another video on what are scale scores and standard scores. So if you need more information on that, you can go look at that. But they would fill that in. And then for vocabulary, let's say the student got like, I'm just randomly making up numbers here. So don't be thrown by that. Let's say that they got 20. I don't know why I wrote in a three, uh, 22 items correct. Pardon my handwriting on that. And their um, scaled score on that came out as an eight. Okay. We then add these two together, which gives us a verbal comprehension composite of the subtest scores of 20, we would then take that 20 and go into yet another table and look up what their composite score of, and I can 100% say with confidence, it's either 99 or 100. When you have a composite of 20, the average of it turned in from a Scale score to a standard score goes to 100. So to get any of these composite scores, you actually have to um, use two of the subtests 
add them up and then go look them up in another table. Is it always two? Oh, it is always two. Look, always yeah. two. Okay. okay. Now let's say that you had a student that that something weird happened during this um, vocabulary subtest. You might go in then and administered information, um, and it gets into a lot of subtlety and nuance that I don't think we want to get into. But there are things that you can do when you have weird administrations. But let's not go deep on that, okay? Um, and so I will tell you too that some clinicians um, give a lot of the tests because it paints a completely different picture. There's some additional scales that can be done um, and, and it helps us better understand what a student needs. Now that's the standard front page, but what I wanna show now is this back page because, and I, why is it all green? There we go. Um, it offers some additional subtests and some additional composite scores. Okay. So what you would, as a clinician, do is you would bring your scores over from the front page onto this back page. So you, for example, we had, um, it helps if I set up to annotate again, um, we remember we had a, a 12 on similarities and we said we had an eight on vocabulary. And, you know, if we just randomly filled in some scores here, I'm just going to make up some numbers. Um, you would then add up these subtest scores in this column to yield what's called a general ability index score. Okay. And we're going to talk about that in a little more in a little bit. But it also has a cognitive proficiency, it has a nonverbal, it has an auditory working memory, it has a quantitative reasoning. Now, I had a parent that was really confused. So, Kim, what would you think cognitive proficiency means as a parent? Well, cognition, maybe just like how much information they knew. Like, I don't know. Okay. So this particular student did very poorly on it. And so if I tell you digit span, coding, picture span, and symbol searcher on it, does that change oh, the way you yes. think of it? Yes. Now I would think of that as a kid who probably has dyslexia. Yes. Okay. So the cognitive proficiency has nothing to do about, are you a good thinker? It has everything to do with, do you have good working memory and can you think very quickly? That is a very confusing title for that. I didn't even look at the. Where Isn't it are. horrible? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense at all. Yeah. Uh, I literally had a mom in my office in tears saying my child is not dumb. And this says they're down in like the sixth percentile. And I said, you're right. Your child is not dumb. And the name on it is horrible. And I was trying to explain what it was and she was just having a complete meltdown. So this is actually the entire reason that we're doing this is this so is very important. see these, mm -hmm. they have a better understanding. Now, these are some other optional subtests and let me actually clear that screen here. Um, and then down here, um, which most parents won't see, even though there's no reason that they shouldn't, they have some calculations and we're gonna talk about those another day, but it's a way of comparing scores to think about whether or not the scores make sense statistically, hmm. right? But we're, we're gonna save that for another day. We'll do that another day. So now let's kind of dive in and let's talk about um, the various, um, subtests, what they actually measure, and give parents some real ideas of what's going on. Okay, so this is the order that the subtests are given. And just like we saw on that first page, here's where we get the various composite scores. And then we just talked about these are the seven tests that you use for a full scale IQ. And then here is the five tests that are used for a general intellectual ability index score. And we'll talk about that in more depth in a little bit. 
So the first one that we want to talk about is a test called block design. Now, Kim, you happen to have a game sitting mm -hmm. there with you. Do you want to go ahead and show the cover of the box? Sure. First, I'm going to go to my... Ta-da! And... You might want to do a little wrangling with your camera oh, right. a bit, but the game is called Cubits. Cubits. Kim, is this a favorite game for you, or is this a game you don't like? <laughs> well, you really want me to tell them. This is a game that I have a bit of a problem with visual spatial integration issues. And I had never done this before in my life. And this, uh, when Cindy gave me this, practiced a test on me one time to see how I did it in it, I got really frustrated and anxious and uh, ran out of the room. <laughs> so I was so mad at myself that I went and bought the game and realized that I can do it um, I didn't have the natural ability to do it, but I taught myself how to do it and I became good at it. Okay. Now you can go ahead and take the box away. Now okay. you pull out a card and you pulled out the blocks and okay. like, there's an obvious correlation here that's similar to what we do in block design, but this is actually dramatically different. Now, Kim, you crack me up when you say you ran out of the room crying because I do not remember that at all. <laughs> I, I, at least I felt like this. it. <laughs> But that's okay. All right. So Kim, why don't you show us one of the blocks? Okay. Walk each, us through the various sides. Okay. Each block has a solid side, um, a blank side. Mm -hmm. It has a white background with a colored circle. Mm -hmm. And then it has a green background with a white circle. Mm -hmm. It has um, one corner tri right triangle in green, one corner right triangle in white. Mm -hmm. Um. And again, the same way, but the opposite corners with the dark color on the left hand upper left corner. I don't know if I did that right, but anyway. You got these, it, we're close enough. Yeah, I mean, these compose uh, what you use to create this type of picture. Okay, and then what would a student do if you were actually playing the game? Uh, well, you can play it different ways, but we do, what we usually do is we each have our own little, uh, you know, wooden frame and right. we each have our own color and we put this card down and we see who can go the quickest and to complete the entire um, shape picture. So why don't you show us like either the top row or the left or the right row really quickly? Because I'm very... <laughs> methodical in my approach don't worry about it just take your time We're I, not tend, judging. I tend to go left to right okay that works for me and uh you know some other kids do it everybody does it different ways but I am going through and I am not crying and I'm doing it you're doing amazing and so <laughs> you happened to have rolled like the dice that you initially picked were all oriented correctly mm -hmm. but let's say you were to do the next one and you actually picked it up initially it was solid white you would then that's how it started now how do you fix it to match what's on the card so i well sometimes we would play the little game i would uh i'm not gonna do that but anyway i um i mess around with it and i make it match awesome okay so you can stop, you can unshare now unless you really want to finish the card. And I laugh because it's not so hard now. I don't know why I thought it was so hard. Well, so block design on an intelligence test is similar to that, but not exactly the same. Okay. The blocks have fewer options mm -hmm. on the configurations of them. So there's no dots. Um, there is half and half and there is solids, um, but they give you relatively complex figures. Mm. And the other terrible thing that they do on it, do you remember? It's not timed. It is timed. You told me I could. Mm. Mm. I read the instructions the exact same way to everybody every single time. And in the instructions, they don't tell you that it's timed. Oh, that's why you never told me it was okay. So they tell you to work um, work as fast as you can without making mistakes kind of thing. But they don't tell you there's a time limit. They don't tell you how long the time limit is. They don't tell you any of those things. So, wow. And they don't tell you why they're timing. And I'm not going to go into that either because, like I said, we want to 
preserve the usefulness of the test. We want you to have an idea as a parent without compromising the validity of the test. Okay. So block design is a visual spatial task. How do I mentally parse the design? How do I put it together? Um, can I figure out the configurations and can I make it look like a target? Okay. Yep. All right. So now let's go back to our list and let's actually work through and let's do all the visual spatial first, right? Okay. Don't you think that makes sense? Yes. All right. So the next one that we want to talk about, and I just realized I goobered my deck here. I, we started making these on index cards and then we moved to the computer. But I can find my little pieces here in just a second. Ah, there we go. So on the visual puzzles, pardon my little mess here. The visual puzzles subtest, they will give you, I don't know why I'm turning it one way or another, they're giving you a target design. And then down below, they are going to give you six, oops, and I just dropped one. Oh my goodness, there we go. Um, they're gonna give you six options. And in your mind, you're supposed to decide which three of the pieces could go together to build this figure. And Kim, if I asked you to do, do that right now, if I could number correctly. Oh my God. Can you mentally think about which three of these would go together to build this figure? Um, I would take three first and make it in the upper left hand corner i hope um Ooh. is that bad keep going what other two i'm telling you this is on? hard for me <laughs> i know just take your time and then i think i would try six okay and then i think i would try Okay, so now that's exactly what you do on the test is you would tell me the number of the pieces. So I'm gonna move those out of the way and I'm gonna come in and I'm going to see if we could put them together to make the target figure. And yes, you did it oh, perfectly. Thank God, okay. Okay, now in the test, unfortunately you don't actually get to move the pieces and they, they are not, like this, but that's how we did it to make it like the test. But you mentally have to figure out, it's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle, but only doing it in your head. Mm. And um, they're looking to see if you can accurately put that together. Okay. All right. Does that all make sense so far? Yep. Okay. I can tell you're thrilled by it. But we're coming no. to one that I yeah. know you actually would like. <laughs> that this one is right up your alley. So let's jump back to our little page here. And again, we've, we've completely made up these items. So the next one that we're gonna talk about is similarities, okay? And on this particular subtest, let's, Kim, you get to play victim again. And okay. unfortunately, I put answers up here for you. But if I said, in what way are a chair and a stool alike? And do you, I can't remember, are there pictures for the kids to see? Zero pictures. Ah. All verbal. And what if the kid didn't know what a stool was? Or welcome to the challenge of intellectual ability measures. Okay. Okay. All I am allowed to do is read the prompt. So if I use the word continuous and you hear contiguous or you hear something else, and if I use the word brief and you're like, what are you talking about? So I have to read the words correctly up front, but you have to know what the words mean. Okay. Yeah. And so we have example answers here. What's when you heard chair and stool, how would you think to put them together? Um, 
the first thing I thought of is uh, you put your you put you can sit on them. That's the first thing I thought of. Okay. And then we talked about it a little bit more, and we actually came up with the idea that it's furniture, right? Mm -hmm. So actually, on the intellectual ability measure, they have got a ton of different answers, okay? And they have what they consider high quality answers, adequate answers, and then poor quality answers where a student is not able to identify the relationship. And they, the other really critical piece here that we didn't mention in all of this is before the student is given the task, they're actually read a set of instructions and typically there's a learning trial where I would say, for example, I might say, in what way are Q and R alike? And you would say they're both letters. I'd say that's right. Q and R are both letters. Okay. If somebody answered they're both rounded, I would say that's not quite right. Q and R are both letters. So you're trying to get the student attuned to the task to understand what's being asked of them. Mm -hmm. But after that, after the first couple of items, there's no feedback in terms of you're doing well, you're doing poorly. Um, we came up with some other examples, cloudy and sunny. You know, the idea that it, a student might answer it's the sky, they might give you a better answer, like it's weather. If they just focused on the sun, they're missing kind of central elements of that. And then this was a hard one when we pulled up continuous and brief, and we decided this would be a horrible answer or a horrible prompt. Do you remember why? Um, no. No. Span of time? You you came up with span. I just said time. Right. Um, brief could mean underwear. Oh, well, of could course. Mean yeah. Brief as in a legal issue. It could mean brief as in a span of time. So that so, means the student has to have the multiple meanings, understanding there's more meanings of one word than meets the eye kind of thing. So when they actually create the test, they're doing that level of analysis. Oh. to say, is this an appropriate answer or is this an appropriate pairing of concepts? Could these be misinterpreted different yeah. ways and leave them confused where there isn't necessarily a relationship? Because if we said continuous and brief and a kid is thinking about underwear, briefs as underwear style, then there is no relationship. So right. they would They're never be... pick an item like that. Right. Okay. All right. Um, the other really interesting thing is that sometimes a student will give an answer and the clinician will prompt them. Do you remember what I said about that? Yes. Tell me more. Yeah. And that's where student can expand on their explanation to show you whether or not they fully understand the relationship and the, and the building between the concepts. Right. Yeah. Um, they will start off fairly simple with concrete, and then they move to way more abstract. Okay. Do you know what this one is measuring? Well, it's me measuring your vocabulary and also your flexibility of thinking in regards yeah, to- Yeah, that's exactly energy. it, right? So it's it's a verbal, fluid reasoning. Can I- determine what a relationship is and can I explain why those things might have a relationship and how abstract concepts can have meetings and relationships. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So similarities, the next one is vocabulary. Do you remember this? Yes. Okay. Now you asked, are there pictures on the similarities? Interestingly, on the vocabulary um, for very young students or students that struggle with the first item, they actually do do a picture based. So mm -hmm. I'll show you a picture and ask you to say what the name of the picture is. Okay. Just after those first couple of items, they begin to just give you oral words. Mm -hmm. And you said something that was really profound when I pulled up the example of flower. Do you remember what you said? Um. 
I asked if there was a picture of a flower and if there weren't, and it was just auditory, how did, well, the student has to describe the vocabulary. So how are they supposed to know which one it is? Okay. Right. right? Yeah, and they actually do that. So there are several items on there where there can be what is considered a correct answer for multiple meanings. Because so, again, they're not seeing any words and they're not, most of the time, not seeing any pictures. Yeah. And I, I have kids say, can you use it in a sentence? And I say, can you tell me the meaning of the word flower? Because that is a sentence. And they're like, that's not what I wanted. And I'm like, sorry, <laughs> it's testing your knowledge, not mine. I don't say it quite like that. Um, it's, but, but, mm -hmm. it's so scripted. Like there's but for no those meaning. multiple meaning words, do they get credit if they say so, it's a comes from we and you use it to bake a cake. I mean, do yes. they get, okay. So that would be considered correct. Um, you could say it is a plant with petals that has a bloom on it. Um, you could also, um, I have to think of more esoteric connotations, um, but they actually have a range of multiple meaning definitions and they tell the clinician to look for the concept, not specific, like there's general words, but if you've got the concept and because they give you multiple examples of what they consider an adequate definition, you're supposed to see if it fits into those categories. Okay. Okay. Like this one, like the previous one with um, the similarities, if a student gives you an answer and it's not quite as complete. Often as a clinician, they're prompted to tell the student, tell me more about that. And as we know, a lot of our students, not a lot, but some students will misinterpret sounds within the word. So they literally change continent into consonant or. Yes, that's exactly why we pick that one, right? And there's nothing really you as a, administrator of the test can do well actually there's a little blurb on the bottom that says listen carefully continent so you would pronounce it again oh after prompting them to listen carefully i see but you can't give them any other context that's it that's it now we picked this word and you like this word what's the challenge with this word unusual again they're not they're just hearing what is the challenge it is a it is a multi-syllable one two three four it's not so much that no is it oh, it's the definition that is it's a little bit esoteric for them to define it's not as concrete it's more abstract right there's not something i can pick up and say this is an unusual like right. this is a can or like this is a pen it's a concept mm -hmm. and that so they'll start off with the very concrete things and gradually move to more abstract or unusual things that um require if you will apologize for the the way i'm going to explain it um uh it requires and i lost the word that i was going to use it requires the ability to explain something that's abstract yeah it has so subtlety and nuance uh -huh. right yes. that's out there okay so the two of these together come up with a composite that is verbal comprehension now kim do you see a lot of kids with that have been administered to WISC by the school district and what do you often notice on their WISC scores if they're dyslexic or dysgraphic well First of all, their vocabulary can oftentimes be low. Mm -hmm. So they will have great difficulty even knowing what the word is when you say it mm -hmm. because they've sometimes said words wrong in their own mind. Um, they may hear it differently and not associate it with the item that it's referring to. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Also, I have kids that misplaced sounds and words mm -hmm. 
And so sometimes they will create a new, like what we were talking about before, mm -hmm. um, they'll create a new word. And I, I mean, just in general, they, they have oftentimes the vocabulary is not there. Okay. I often see some students that if I gave them a paper and pencil definition task, they would, they would do nothing with it. Like we would get minimal production, but often my students with dyslexia, um, who are good observers in the world can have robust similarities in vocab scores. And often it can be an area of strength. So it varies by student, but it gives you a hint of, hey, if they're not great at paper and pencil tests where they're asked to write out a lot of stuff, but if we give them an oral option. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oftentimes mm -hmm. they will give us depth and breadth of knowledge that we didn't anticipate otherwise. I mean, they could know what very sophisticated words mean because they listen to podcasts or the news, but you but you ask them to write a sentence. It doesn't look at all like what they visually, the sophistication of explaining a concept out loud back to you. It, it yeah. is a stark, stark difference. Yeah. Okay. So we have knocked off verbal comprehension, visual, spatial, we're now moving on to fluid reasoning. Now, we talked a little bit about fluid reasoning and do you, you actually asked me what fluid reasoning was. Right. Um, and as I, always, Kim took notes. Yes, I love notes. And why can I see it? And the fluid reasoning, oh, it it's the ability to see and matrix, like within the category of fluid reasoning, there's this, this category called matrix reasoning mm -hmm. because you're able to notice patterns. And but relationships. It, and relationships. Yeah. Um, and then you said, what is a matrix? And I yeah. said, this is a matrix. So they're establishing a relationship and you have to figure out what that relationship is and how you would apply that. Now, I did not talk to you about this up front, but how can you, how do you immediately think of this problem? How would you work this? If you were going to tell us what you were thinking in your brain as you were thinking of this problem, how would you mentally describe what's going on here? Well, I, I would try, especially when I would try to see what the pattern is up top on the top level okay so what would you say to yourself um same shape but the same the shape has changed color okay um, so when you go to the second row you would say um okay we have a circle so i'm going to create the same shape and that i need to make that the same color as the shape above and so from the answer choices down below you would pick i would pick four excellent now so I'm gonna blow your mind a little bit. Do you know that you can also work it vertically? So, oh, our pentagon turns into a circle. Mm -hmm. So our pentagon turns into, turns a, into a circle. circle. That's so funny because I'm so left right oriented. You're right. Right, and that's what a lot of people are. And so actually, in the instructions on matrix based tasks, we say that's the correct answer. Both working across and working down okay so the kids understand that there's just not one way to work it now okay. the other really interesting thing you will see is i have in our potential answers here i've repeated what's in the matrix mm -hmm. and i will often see students who don't understand this task will give me an answer of two so they'll repeat what they see above or they'll give me an answer of five because they'll repeat what's above or, um, but they won't recognize what's happening in that, which is informative to me as a clinician. It helps me better understand what their reasoning process is, okay? So we've got the matrix. Then we have another kind of problem, which I appear to have lost somewhere in Oh my goodness, we had a sequential one. And I think oh, yes, with the little circles with the. Yeah, I don't know where it went. So um, oh. let me, let's go old school. Let me just draw. 
I'm so bummed that we lost that it was so great. Mm -hmm. um, so what we did for that is we had um, a circle with the upper right corner. Right. Mm -hmm. um, right and that corner. was our first one. And then we had one that looked like uh, the lower that. left corner was cut out. And then we had a question mark. And when we had one that looked like that, no, that's not the right one, is it? Uh, the um, No, it's in the upper left hand corner. Yeah. Cut off. So we're kind of giving away the answer, but that's okay. And then it goes back to... Yeah like that and then down below you had five answer choices and since we've already given away the answer which is the lower left hand corner yeah okay and then they would be numbered um and they would give similar so distractible you're... right so and then you say yes that's the next one that comes in order so this is based on like do you understand that you're turning something clockwise and right. seeing the pattern of where the cut is in the circle? Um, you could also have something like this where they're giving you, um, and my second drawing there is not fabulous, but then they do something like that where oh, I what's see. next. So there's okay. lots of different sequences. So that's it's just another way of getting at can you recognize patterns and can you see the relationships of the patterns um, and can you apply that in context? And obviously we gave some really simple examples, but um, they get way more complex where you have layers of patterns that you have to reason through. And again, okay. this is under the big category, fluid reasoning, but fluid reasoning. Yeah. Now, we have another test in fluid reasoning. Um, do you remember which one it is? Um, no. Okay. Not the figure weights. Oh, it, it is, the figure. is the figure weights. Okay. Okay. Now we've got scales here and this first scale shows that. One, one, two, three, four, five, six. Hexagon equals two eggs. Okay. And down here we have Two hexagon equals how many eggs? Okay, and your answer would be? Two. Excellent. That one's super simple and super straightforward. So it starts off easy, and then it gradually gets more complex. And I will tell you, I see something really interesting that happens on this. So I will see kids get very simple ones correct, and then they'll miss a simple one and they'll get it right. And then they'll miss a simple one and they'll get it right. And then they go on to get the most complex items correct. Is this because of attention deficit? Can be an attention deficit. Can also be a visual spatial thing where they don't count things correctly. Mm. So the, the number of items fit in the box while they try and make the shapes very distinct kids often don't really take the time to double check. Is it the right color? Is it the right shape? Is it the right number? They don't check all the attributes as closely as they should. Okay. And so if your student is very good at math and in particular algebra, and this score happens to be low, this in the matrix reasoning one, uh, you should take a minute and ask the clinician, did they make errors on easy items early on and then go on to get harder items correct? Were they just not paying attention to the details? Or do you think there truly is a fundamental issue with their understanding of this relationship? Hmm. Um, also, by the way, on this one, this becomes more complex later in the task because you're actually given three scales. Hmm. And so you'll have to determine use the first two to determine the relationship in the third. Okay? Okay. Okay. Um, so that marks makes us get through the figure weights and our fluid reasoning. So now we're gonna talk about working memory. And we don't actually have a page for digit span um, because it's it would be confusing to describe it that way. So there are three parts to digit span. So in the first part, do you know what I do? Wait, can I ask you one question first? Sure. 
Can you explain to them what working memory means? Why don't you explain to them what working memory means? Let's see if I can do it. Okay. <laughs> I, it's the ability to hold on to information in your head and while while you are doing the task and to be able to hold it in your in your brain, this part of your brain, and allow it to sit there as you use it to perform other tasks. Good, good. You brought up the really critical part, which was what I was hand signaling to you, was you for it to be truly working memory, you have to manipulate it in some way. Okay. Now... The thing that I don't like about this is the very first part of digit span. All I do is read you a series of numbers and you have to repeat it back to me in the same order. Oh yeah. So they're not really doing a full working memory measure. It's just a short-term auditory short-term memory task. Oh. That's part one. Part two is I read you a series of numbers and you have to do them do you remember? Backwards and forwards? Backwards. Just backwards. Yeah, I so remember. I said three, five, nine. Uh -huh. You would say three, five, nine. That would be forward. Now, how do you do it backwards? Oh, um, three, five, nine, nine, five, three. There you go. That, and did you watch your eyes actually went up? Yes. As you said it? Yes. Yes. Which we'll talk about another time. Okay. So forward, backward, and then um, you're not going to remember it. I'll give it no, to I you. Don't. Sequence. So now you have to give them to me smallest to largest. Oh, geez. I don't remember that one. Okay. Okay. So if I said five, one, two, mm -hmm. you would say. You want smallest to greatest? Mm-hmm. One, two, five. Excellent. And that's the working memory piece in it. Now, kids have all sorts of different strategies to do that. And we're not going to go into those. But so the digit span forward tells us one piece. The backward tells us another piece in the sequencing. And you actually add all three scores on that together mm -hmm. to get your overall digit span score. Mm -hmm. And so ironically, I will have kids that do fairly well going forward struggle going backwards but then kill it in short sorting and sequencing hmm. and it all means a really different. interesting pattern hmm. okay. okay next we have picture span and i showed you this and you were like Ugh, right so we're going to jump ahead so in picture span um i'm just going to leave it there so picture span, typically you would get to see, and these are just very simple pictures we pulled out of Microsoft Word. So these are not actual representations of what's on the test, but we pulled out four pictures of animals. And so you would get to look at that and you've gotten to look at it for way too long now. So you get to look at it. And then I would say, point to the pictures in the order that you saw them. And ironically, I could do that digit span backwards and forwards but uh -huh. when it comes to pictures, that's my difficulty. Okay. Do you have I any have any idea? I think the hamster was first. Okay. I think maybe the bunny was second. Okay. I don't know. And maybe the elephant third and the whale last. I can't remember. You're spot on. Okay. Well, that was luck. <laughs> I don't right. know. How to do that. You verbalized it? They make this a nonverbal task where you actually have to point to them. So you can't name the object. Oh, I always verbalize. Yes. Yeah. So it's a great strategy. And you can verbalize it while you're doing it. They're not going to prompt you to do that, but they require you to actually point to the pictures. So you can verbalize and point. Okay. Yeah. But, but for people like me who the verbal gives me, why does it help me so much? I don't know. Because you are a language-based less left hemisphere thinker. Mm. You live in your left hemisphere. I do. You talk through everything that you do on every level in life. Right? <laughs> okay. It's not a bad thing. It's just a thing, right? Yeah, it's a thing. And I'm a deep right hemisphere thinker. Mm -hmm. um, it's not that I can't explain things verbally, but I tend to function very deeply right hemisphere. 
uh, with my background in chemistry and a few other odds and ends. Okay, so that is picture span. Now, remember, this is not measured or used. The score from this is not measured in the full scale IQ, but it does give us that composite working memory score. All right. Okay. And we are into the last zone, which yeah. is, pardon me for hopefully not making anybody nauseous as I'm scrolling that up and down. We've got two processing speed measures. Now, Kim, how do you think of processing speed? Wow, this is so critical to processing speed is how quickly can you look at symbols and turn them into meaningful and turning them into meaningful things and um, how quickly can you uh, be reading and from left to right and find um, basically break the code. This is re this is basically has to do with reading to some degree. It can also affect your ability to recall math facts quickly, right? Oh, yes. Right? So it's how quickly can you kind of move through information? And you're automatically bringing it to reading because we see it so consistently with kids that have dyslexia. We see a low coding score. Um, but that's not the only reason coding can be low. But I 100% I understand why you're linking them together. I um, the thing that I tell everybody, my mantra is there is no test that works on one thing in isolation. There is no one pure measure of processing speed where there's nothing else involved. There's no one pure measure of working memory where there's nothing else involved. There is no way that I know of where you can measure one thing and nothing else is measured while you're doing it necessarily. Um, and I have to say, this is a little bit confusing to me because you can have a brilliant, brilliant person who has slow processing speed when it comes to responding to an answer to a question. But that's a little bit different than what we're talking about here, correct? Yes, that's exactly to my point is I will see kids that have been diagnosed with a processing speed disorder because the processing speed composite score is low. But then when I go and look at their time performance on uh, a timed reading measure um, or addition, subtraction, how many addition, subtraction, and multiplication facts can you do in three minutes or whatever the time limit is, and they can do quite well. And so that's exactly to the point. There is no pure measure of processing speed that doesn't incorporate something else. So let's look at them and let's talk about coding. Um, so let's zip right to here. So you can tell I hand drew, drew these. So in the coding task, we've got our key up here. You know, here are the various symbols that we use. I would then demonstrate, hey, we're going to translate the numbers into symbols. Um, the student would then practice with a couple of them. So they would do something like that, and then they would do something like that, and then we would establish that they knew how to do it. And then I would say, great, I want to see how many you can do as fast and as accurately as you can, and click. And then they go in and they fill in as many of, they, of them as they can, as fast as they can, and they have to go in order. Because I have parents say all the time, well, I would just go through and do all the ones. I say, well, you're not allowed to do that. Okay, Kim, why, what students can you think of that we work with would potentially have a hard time with this for a reason other than processing speed? Dysgraphia. Ta-da! Ding, 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 ding! You just nailed it. So dysgraphia is difficulty with reading and- um, Dysgraphia. As you, dis, I'm sorry, with writing. And How do I so get what's in my head down through my hand, right? Yes, through your fingers. Um, and so the difficulty here is it, they have difficulty holding pictures. Do you see how they have to look up to the top, then look to the bottom, and up to the top? I'll, oftentimes, for a kid that where it has the one and the slash, that even though it seems silly to you, maybe as a parent, they can't hold that slash. That slash disappears when they look down to the chart below. It is very difficult for them to hold that image in their head so they can create this coding mechanism. 
and then they have to switch it constantly and they have a hard time forming the symbols. There's a lot that goes into this measure, a ton that mm -hmm. goes into this measure. And many clinicians think of it only as processing speed. No. So it's memory, it's got visual motor integration, it's got attention. There are lots of things that are involved in that. Yeah. Okay. Then we have symbol search. And I initially put in this symbol search and you're like, wait, 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 what's going on here? And I, you were like, do you remember what you said about this? Um, well, I just said, why are there two symbols when there's only one present in the row? And that's the point. Right. It's for more sophisticated. So younger kids, so six through seven year olds just have one symbol to look for. And what they're expected to do is draw a line through the matching symbol, right? And if there is not the symbol there, then they draw a line through the no box, mm. okay? Older students have to look at both of these. If they see either one of these here, they draw a line through it. If they don't see either of the shapes here, they draw a line through the no box, okay? And then they would do them as quickly as they can. So why might I see a higher symbol search than coding score for a student with dysgraphia? Uh, you mean they're doing better with the symbol search? Right. Well, for me, it's because they can look from left to right across and, um, hmm. They're not, have, well, they're checking from left to right to relook at the symbol. I think that the symbols are more, for, I, I don't know. Are they more formed in the symbol search? No. So the oh, directionality is here, I have to draw the symbol in. Oh, you're not drawing it. Jeez, of course. Yeah. You're not drawing it. It's too late cameras... tonight. It was a trick question. Yeah. Uh, no, that's good. Yeah. So all you're doing is simply making a slash mark, right? Mm -hmm. And right. if you can scan quickly, you're in great shape because as long as I can tell which box you marked, we're all good here. Yeah. If you misdraw, let's say you take that three and you do something where it looks like a six, then you don't right. get credit on it. That's right. Right. And again, we've used overly simplistic figures and I don't want to confuse people with that. Don't assume that any of these are there. Do not train your child up in any of these, <laughs> but the motoric component of coding can be horribly low, not because the student thinks slow, but because the motor component gets in their way or the visual memory gets in their way, which at that point then symbol search would be low too. And we will talk about that more in another video later. Yeah. But let's do a quick, really quick discussion of G general ability index scores. We're gonna come back in another video and talk about this in more depth. So we talked about the fact that we have students with dyslexia and dysgraphia that find the coding to be difficult and they find the digit span to be difficult. And so when they do a general ability index score, they pull these five subtests out and say, we recognize that there are kids out there in which when we measure their IQ, these two scores dramatically pull down their full scale IQ and masks what their true potential is. And you and I looked at a case recently where when those two were included, the student's IQ came up as like a 106, 107, 108. When we pulled out digit span and coding, their full scale IQ went to like a 114, 115, 116. And it suddenly changed what academic scores were now below expected given their full scale IQ. It is so critical that you understand that because your kid cannot qualify for help at school if that IQ score is whatever, eight points lower than it could be. So you and as a parent really need to understand this. 
we're going to do a whole video just on that. We're going to talk about discrepancies between scores. We're going to talk about discrepancies between index scores. We're going to talk about a general ability index score and how you as a parent can come in and go, hey, wait, does this make sense? Is it statistically or clinically significant? The clinically being the more important piece, we'll explain what that is, to help you better advocate for your child and having school districts or clinicians accurately identify what your child needs and why. Yep. So thank you, Kim. I know this was a long drawn out process, but I feel like you're so much more knowledgeable. You're way more knowledgeable than you were when this started. 20 started. years what, ago. <laughs> what the test measures, how it measures it, how it kind of yeah. works. Yes. That deep dive, I think, has been really helpful for you and yeah. helpful, super helpful to parents. Yeah, very interesting. Please, if you have questions, comments, would like us to do a video on a particular topic, leave us comments. We'd love to hear what you think of this. And with that, good night. Good night.